It is November the 18th, 2021, and you are listening to, I have to press the right button here, Curiously Polar. Yeah, we're doing this all live, including me pressing the buttons to play music and stuff. Um, my name is Chris Marquardt. We're back with another episode of Curiously Polar, and with me is Mario Acorone. Hmm. How are you doing today? Mario, I'm doing fine up here. It's the... Uh Practically the last day of uh, sun up here in Tromso before the polar night. It's uh, quite clear. Oh, outside. is this, is this a, today a kind there. of the official yeah. changeover? Yeah, it's like it depends on how you consider it. But uh, today is the last day the sun comes over the mountains. But of course, the mountains in the south are um, a little higher than the horizon. So we so, have a couple of days with the astronomical uh, the astronomical uh, dark day or Mercury no real star. sun. What is it? What is it like? I've been to uh, the Arctic in Feb in in June during the, yep. the midsummer night, which is was exciting for me. I've been to the Arctic in February, where mm -hmm. it's, it was um, quite dark. Yeah. Um, what is it like mid November? Is it a is it a permanent twilight kind of situation? Yeah. No. I mean, it really depends on where you are. I mean, I, now we like talk about Tromso. Tromso is uh, at uh, sixty, almost sixty nine degrees north. So we are a bit into the Arctic Circle, but we are not like in Svalbard, but in just Longyearbyen, a little where bit, it's, yes. where it's really dark uh, all yeah. the time <laughs> when it gets dark. Um, um, here, the sun is uh, in the middle of the day, in the central hours, the three, four hours, is just below the horizon. So, so we do get uh, this uh, twilight. It's very dark, especially when there is no snow, and now we are having a period. We had snow. We had about five centimeters of snow two weeks ago and then we have now a bout of uh, plus five and we had just rain today is actually quite clear so hopefully tomorrow we'll see a lunar eclipse tomorrow morning and um but uh the yeah there is just a little bit of snow on top of the mountains out there out of the window and uh nothing i mean green grass uh, yeah, on there is just uh, like a bare ground everywhere else, and, which is uh, interesting. And with more dark days and nights, um, there is obviously a greater chance to see the aurora, which I've just a few days yes. ago seen a current picture from Tromso, which had mm -hmm. like amazing northern lights. What is it like living there? Is that more like, yeah. Well, or do you still go yeah, outside? Exactly, and look, do, exactly. Do you still go outside, look in the sky, and go, "Wow"? Or is it just a daily or, or a normal occurrence? If I if I happen to go out and see something uh, because uh, because I I follow the sun's activity, yeah, I I might go out like uh, tonight, for example. But uh, it's not that I'm really actively looking for it. It's it's, it's, it's now, not like the tourists who come there just for that. <laughs> I mean, I've been here. I've been here for fourteen years, and right. uh, like after a while, I've gathered a few pictures. It's always nice. It's always different. Yes. But uh, I try to find the the best moments. For example, when I like a lot when there is a full moon and the aurora. Oh, okay. and then to get the full moon, the aurora, in the clear sky, nah, that's uh, that's that is difficult. <laughs> All right. But uh, so I I try these things. But it's it's always nice to uh, to see the aurora. That's really yeah. And hopefully we get some snow because when the sky, when the uh, ground is uh, so dark and there is no sun, it can become a little bit uh, dark. <laughs> it's much better. Dark, dark in all in ground. all senses of the word, I guess. Yes. So put on, <laughs> yes, put on those put on those bright lights and uh, yeah. use use electricity to help out. Um, okay, so we've had a we've had a bit of a break. We're back, but it's just the two of yeah. us because Henry is. Far away, somewhere on the ship. As far away, well, it should be. Uh, it should be almost down in Antarctica. We hope yes. that uh, he's having a, he's having fair weather down there. Yeah, um, I wanted to start by uh, giving an update on something that we mentioned in the last episode. We said that the, we would come with an update about uh, the 40th meeting of the convention. Uh, the Commission on the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources, or CAMELAR. And they had to have their meeting in the middle of October or the end of October. 
it's the 40th meeting and they were to uh, for the fifth year in a row to deliberate on marine protected areas around Antarctica and I'm sorry to say that it was not uh, uh, approved. It's not a motion that it was passed. It was not agreed to establish these marine, large marine protected areas. And I am pretty sure that uh, this would go to next year's meeting. Oh, it's, so, so um, there, there's, there's not like yeah. an appeals court or something. It just no. gets uh, shelved until the next uh, meeting. This is uh, the the uh, the states that uh, are participating in this uh, in this commission. They do have to um, they do have to agree on various things, and they have to include it in their rules and regulations and laws. And uh, and this is uh, this is the world of uh, international agreements. And uh, we'll see later in this episode about <laughs> we'll have other, a bit more on other that things for sure. Yeah. But oh, at least, no. I mean, this is this is something that uh, will uh, has come up now for the fifth year. It's much more refined. A project next year is going to be even more refined. People will have had time to, uh, or the the commissioners will have had time to to look at it uh, and discuss it, and uh, and hopefully it will be it will be um, endorsed and agreed upon. Yeah, and signed. All right, item one on the Poland newsreel. We only have two mm. items on the newsreel before yeah. we dip in our into our topic. So, second one yes. is this. another one that's slightly concerning, isn't it? Yeah. Now we go up to the to the north. We go up to the Arctic ice, and uh, this is the news of a large polynia or a large rift in the in the old ice uh, north of. Uh, uh, Ellesmere Island in Greenland, and uh, so these are these are pictures from two th from the year two thousand. And from wait, satellite. wait, wait! So far, we've yeah. had uh, like rifts in the ice and big chunks uh, coming off from the Antarctic, mostly big glaciers and yeah. big big uh, uh, big um, tabular ice flows of yeah. ice moving away. Mm -hmm. uh, this is up in the Arctic. Yeah. It is up in the Arctic, and of course, this is uh, like in the Arctic Ocean. This is the um, the part of the Arctic Ocean that uh, touches the North American continent. We have Ellesmere Island north of so, Baffin Island, north of Canada, and uh, next so, to uh, Greenland. Yes, and we have uh, yeah to the um, we are just uh, to the west of Greenland here. Yeah, and um, yeah, you have uh, the. Uh, in there, just above Ellesmere Island, you have the station of uh, the military base of uh, Resolute. Uh, of um, what's it called? It's Resolute, isn't it? Yeah, um, up there. And um, there is not very many people living up there. No, it's called Alert. It's not Resolute. Um, it's uh, there are not very many people uh, living up there. Um, of course, uh, so the satellite pictures are important. We'll see. In a while, uh, let's, uh, we'll have a little uh, video of uh, a sequence of pictures of what the how the Polynia evolved further down. But uh, this area is an area that is called the last ice area, and uh, it is where this Arctic ice is thickest because of the circulation of currents and the wind. The ice is pressed towards north america uh in the in the arctic basin and and this is where the ice gets up to five meters in thickness and it's multi-year and it's the first time that such a polynia such an opening is has been observed it's first time so, so it's the first time up there unusual. i mean uh, we, it is unusual we have uh, polynias uh, for example in the north of davis uh, of uh, baffin bay like just south of Thule, uh, there in the uh, between Greenland and Canada, there's a big Polynia there. Uh, Polynia is a Russian word that, uh, that, that, that denotes uh, an opening in the ice, in the in mm -hmm. the sea ice, and it's usually due to either the shearing forces, like in this case, or by having an upwelling of warm water in a special place. And, and it's in not Greenland, small. there is one. It's not small. No, this at one all. here is. Yeah, well, it's uh, like. They compare to the size of Rhode Island, which is a small state in the United States, but still, it's uh, it's quite uh, it's uh, a three thousand square kilometers uh, rift. So it's it's quite quite impressive. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Polinias usually are very productive areas because uh, this is where the sunlight can come to the seawater, and uh, and this is where there is a lot of uh, like new plankton, and then krill, and then polar cod, seabirds, whales are coming in there. So in the short term, these things can be uh, these phenomena can be actually quite quite nice to observe. So for uh, for, but, for for the wildlife. Yeah, for the wildlife, but the only ocean in wildlife, the yes. yeah, but only in the uh, only in the in the short term because uh, in the long term, if this it was producing uh, is re- if this phenomenon reproduces year after year, it means that the ice is getting thicker. I mean, this has not happened before. It's getting thinner. Sorry, it's melting. Oh, and, and, it's, and the forces are, are and it's stronger, opening the it's force. opening up the sea to the sunlight, which uh, has uh, a lower albedo, so not as much Perfect. reflectivity, yes. and that and that will pretty much get a get a cycle and, going potentially. Yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a positive um, feedback on the on the warming up there. So a darker yeah. surface, as you're saying. So I think it's uh, it's it's very interesting. Another phenomenon that can happen if if the ice is breaking up in smaller pieces, like you see here at the side of the Polinia or the or the borders of the Polinia. Well, to the to the right of the picture there, where the Ellesmere Island goes down towards Greenland. Well, you have a passage uh, the uh, cane basin and uh, and and that's where the or the Nares strait and that's where ice could be pushed down towards Baffin Bay and therefore the ice can remove itself from the uh, mm-hmm. from the uh, for the polar basin this depends on how the circulation is happening in the Beaufort Sea this is the this part of the Arctic Ocean is called the Beaufort Sea. And uh, there is something called a gyre that goes either in a cyclonic or an anticyclonic direction. So it, the, the winds rotate in either with the clock or against the clock um, when you look at it from, from above. And so if the ice is then pushed towards the east and is fragmented, it can come out that way. If it goes towards the west, then it would go down towards Alaska, and uh, there are st- bigger chances that it will stay in the in the Arctic basin. But still, it's it's quite uh, quite something happening. And uh, as far as I know, nothing has been reported for this last summer. But uh, the data, of course, is not uh, is not out yet. I mean, or the uh, the analysis of these uh, of these images has not has not come out yet. Right. Yeah. So something is happening. Yeah. Okay. But we wanted to talk about something different. I mean... Uh, yeah, we had this ev- event that we have hinted at <laughs> recently and that had ha- yeah. has had some media coverage, even though I think it should have had a bit more coverage. But, yeah, um, how much was, uh, was there of media coverage in, uh, in Germany? Well, I, as I don't really watch that much TV, I cannot say how much it was on TV. It was certainly mentioned in the biggest news shows and every, it was mentioned mm. everywhere for sure. But uh, yeah, okay, I, I'm, I'm not very happy with the entire... I think yeah. it lacked the urgency in some cases. Yes. We have... Right now, okay, this is the 18th of November, we have a very urgent COVID situation in Germany. The numbers yes. have been skyrocketing and now finally yeah. people are getting a real sense of urgency to improve the number, to increase the number of vaccinations, these kind of things. So yeah. there is a big push going on right now. Um, I'm not seeing that for climate, even though... We yeah. are also looking at exponential growth. And I think that's one of the yeah. big issues that uh, humans don't seem to be able to deal with exponential growth scenarios. So, yeah, exactly. Um, because, of course, we are, we are, the, the event is the uh, COP26 in Glasgow. Now, yes. we, of course, it's, uh, it's out, uh, uh, it's uh, over. And uh, and there was uh, quite a lot of, uh, of media <laughs> it's, coverage it's in, in Norway. It was, ex- so. it was extended by a, a whole day because they didn't finish their declaration in time. Yeah, exactly. And uh, and this is um, like it's it's kind of interesting because 
of course, uh, like the convention last year, the uh, COP is a conference of the parties. The 25th was last year in Madrid. It was uh, set up uh, as a last minute replacement for uh, Santiago because it uh, was supposed to be down in South America. And they uh, had, uh, of course, because of COVID, not um, been able to, uh, to, um, to organize it there no big preparation was made. In this case, we have had a uh, preparation in Milan, a pre-COP in Milan, where the ministers have, uh, the governments have, uh, uh, um, well, the major governments have, uh, have tried to agree on a strategy of how to go forward, because, of course, we are talking about uh, limiting climate change. Um, and um, and that, is, uh, that is what uh, was at stake out there. The COP itself is a um, is a is a fair, so there are different pavilions, um, different uh, levels of attendance from normal like people, like people that have no direct uh, work uh, in universities or ministries or something, and then up to the ministers or even presidents uh, uh, that have been attending these uh, these COPs. And, and the, uh, the idea is that uh, science points of view have to be presented. So every pavilion has a program and, uh, and you, I mean, the selection of which pavilions are, are are being are being accepted is uh, is it varies from organizer to organizer, and um, and then delegates need to be accredited. I mean, you cannot uh, you cannot just walk in uh, usually, uh, and uh, and there are talks, there is a media coverage, a press room, and 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 this is uh, this is what a cop is uh, the one is like, and this is what happened in. The one thing that I learned, and there, there's a German podcaster here, Holger Klein, who does, uh, who did a daily report directly from there because uh, someone he knows who, who works for an NGO was there and gave a, like a daily update on how daily things update, are proceeding yeah. and how this whole thing works. And one thing I learned from that is that um, yes, there are talks, there are. There's the big conference hall with big speeches and these kind of things, but those don't really matter that much. It's mostly a a bureaucratic document-based uh, proceeding where a lot of stuff has already been prepared, is being discussed behind closed doors. Um, there are some very public uh, speaking things going on for um, from, from various sides, but the actual decisions are being very meticulously worked on in these working groups because we're talking about something where like everyone has to buy into so or yeah. or not because some of these things have not, not been signed by everyone yeah no exactly and this is uh, this is where there has been a like a, an evolution of the cops and uh, of the convention and on what uh, what has happened. I mean, it's uh, we, when we are talking about agreements, when you are talking about uh, uh, mobilizing funds, uh, limiting uh, the emissions, uh, um, doing something in practice, it is something that the nations have to be agreeing upon oh and, and uh, by the way cop yeah. i have I, I had to look up what cop stands for it stands for conference of the parties yes so, and the um, conference of the parties in this case is a is the parties that have signed the united nations framework convention right. on climate change the un f triple c and uh, maybe you should go a little bit of uh, like seeing the history of uh, of the convention because or like with uh, with climate change because when we when we talk about climate change it's not something totally new uh like uh, in the early 1800s or 1824 uh Fourier, the uh, the French uh, physicist from the Fourier series, if you have studied mathematics, and mm -hmm. <laughs> then uh, he described uh, the greenhouse effect. So how uh, the Earth keeps warm in 1824. spite of the 1824. Okay. So it's not new that we have a greenhouse effect. At that time, it was not. It was something just positive. Now we, it's more a negative connotation. Do you know if it has been called effect. greenhouse effect back then already? Uh, I don't know, but this is actually quite interesting. Okay, can, we'll, we'll uh, figure this out. Go in there, but uh, 
but um yeah i don't know if it was yeah but uh in any case after after fourier started with uh, with the greenhouse effect and described uh, the phenomenon uh then uh like there was uh, there were several others uh, like uh, john tyndall uh, from ireland another physicist looks at how this works and and actually uh, is um, uh, the first one to say that uh, the greenhouse effect is caused by water vapor and other gases and carbon dioxide and uh, and and how this is actually making life possible on earth um uh, then in 1883 the same tyndall is actually making speculations about the burning of coal and this is like uh, the excess carbon dioxide that comes into the atmosphere and this we are therefore at the end of the 1800s and uh, in uh, 1896 arrhenius Svante arrhenius who is uh, was a Swedish chemist chemist and is also known to a lot of people that have studied chemistry uh, he recognizes that uh, uh, the coal can contribute to a lot of co2 and contribute to greenhouse effect and he calculates actually that doubling the co2 levels in the atmosphere will raise the global temperature by several degrees celsius uh, so we are at the end of the 1800s already looking at the, the effect of human activities so it's nothing new but nothing happens really much until uh, until we get to the to the 80s and uh, or nothing happened there is no international agreement or anything there are discussions in the scientific circles about about uh, about climate but not not so much uh, in practice but in 1988 the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change is established. And uh, this is being is established by the World Meteorological Organization, or WMO, and the United Nations um, Environmental Program, UNEP. And the, when, when these two organisms get together and, and uh, make a convention, it means that actually the states have to, uh, have to sign up to the convention. And it's a it's a treaty, and uh, it's a treaty that is made to combat climate change. So the treaty takes some time to be uh, to be to be drafted and to be uh, like made into a form that can be signed. So there are discussions and talks, and in 1992 the treaty is actually signed. And uh, uh, in the, um, maybe uh, you can show the page uh, with a timeline because uh, the. Uh, uh, UNF Triple C is uh, a very nice uh, site. It's uh, there are lots of things, but there is uh, something about the history of the convention, and there is this uh, nice uh, um, uh, timeline, this ribbon, and uh, so we are going. Then the next uh, step that I like to highlight is that um, the first time something in practice is being negotiated is with the Kyoto Protocol or the Kyoto Agreement in 2005. Actually, in 1995, there is a, a first, uh, um, a first uh, effort to make an agreement about limiting greenhouse gases. And in 2005, uh, this, there is a signing of the Kyoto Protocol, it's entered into force, and it's divided into two periods. One from 2008 to 2012, and another one 2012 to 2020, with differing, like a progressive number of measures to reduce the emissions of climate, of climate gases. And uh, so uh, these are the uh, nice, uh, there are lots of conventions or COPs in the, in the meantime, but uh, we mostly remember Kyoto because of uh, the Kyoto. And then the next big agreement is in 2015 in Paris. And this is the Paris Agreement that is signed on the 12th of December 2015. And that's where, and now we're getting very close to us, and this is historical because this is where there is a binding agreement signed by the uh, by the parties about limiting the increase in temperature and they are mentioning a two degree maximum two degree increase above pre-industrial uh, levels of temperature and possibly limiting it 
to 1.5 degrees and these are of course i mean you've heard this uh, you also like in uh, in everywhere in the uh, in the media is this 1.5 degrees warming and mm-hmm. we are now at 1 degree warming already so <laughs> we are we are getting there and and we and we have a development that is not going to stop immediately even if you reduce things so we are looking at a uh, so, someone said it's like trying to steer a big ship with a small rudder, right? It 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 has yes. <laughs> it has an inertia. It keeps yeah. moving forward, even if we yes. stop everything. Yeah. There is still so it's, much up in the atmosphere that it, exactly, yeah. and it is uh, and it is really like uh, it's really important that uh, we also see that uh, we cannot uh, stop. Uh, I mean. We can. Uh, we have seen with the pandemic what uh, what we have been able to do if uh, if really is necessary. But it's really important to uh, try to like keep the livelihood of people. Uh, so it's not just that we can stop uh, heating up the houses, for example. I mean, um, we need energy, and the problem is a little bit more complex than just than just doing it. Um, the um, so the, uh, the 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 COP uh, in uh, the Conference of the Parties in Paris or the signs the Paris Agreement um, has a new course of action, and there is not only an agreement in principle to stop the uh, the heating, so uh, a target temperature increase, maximum temperature increase. There is also a reduction in the CO two level. So we are talking about reducing to uh, stopping the increase of uh, of, of in CO2 uh, emissions in the atmosphere. And uh, we are talking also about helping, um, agreeing on helping uh, countries that are uh, victims of uh, climate change and that do not have the same means and to, to combat climate change. We're talking about uh, uh, archipelagos in the, uh, or atolls in the, uh, in the Pacific. We are talking about uh, states that have a, a very low coastline uh, and that uh, do not have the economy for combating uh, climate change. And this is where we get the other thing that we have heard in the past weeks is these 100 billion a year of help, US dollars, to, of help to, the, uh, to, uh, to adapt and to counter climate change in areas that uh, need uh, capacity building. And uh, and this is where we get to uh, where we get to Glasgow. Uh, so now we have uh, a, uh, we have had uh, like a week long of talks. Before that, there was a meeting in Milan. Uh, so it was uh, it was well prepared uh, by the ministries. But of course, there has been a few there have been a few uh, a few hiccups because of uh, difficulties in traveling. It's difficult. It was difficult to find hotels, and my uh, my colleague and uh, and um, boss at uh, AMAP, he was out there and he reported. And actually, two my two my colleagues, um, uh, uh, Rolf and and Heidi, were were out there, and they actually reported that. It was not a perfect situation because there were too many people, and the, for the restrictions, for the COVID restrictions, it was difficult to get to Glasgow. It was difficult to find accommodation, and uh, it was uh, it was not uh, it was not easy even for people that work with climate uh, climate change like like we do to get there. And um, yeah, and uh, what came out of the uh, of the Glasgow climate change uh, conference is uh, is uh, quite interesting because there is a new commitment there is a a, um, a new commitment that is uh, that can be uh, like uh, what happened we we have heard about about coal especially and uh, this is where uh, it was very difficult to find information of exactly what happened with the uh, with this uh, with this coal uh, uh, discussion, the wording of the agreement made in Glasgow. It was it and, was uh, in the end what I what I heard is that it was about a couple of weaselly words having to be entered to to, exactly. to weaken it in some spots. That's yeah. that's the main gist that I heard. Yeah, and and this is uh, this is where I found that this article in Politico was uh, 
quite clear in in what happened because uh, i mean there have been few scenes like you've seen the uh, the chair uh, the uh, the head of the uh, of the cop um, that was uh, they was crying. Uh, he was uh, like disappointed that uh, things had not happened uh, the way, the way, uh, the way it was set up to. Because at the last minute, uh, there have been uh, changes. So Alok Sharma, uh, who is the UK UK minister in charge of the climate talks, was uh, was very disappointed at that and apologized. And and actually, there are a v- very few. Uh, changes that happen, but uh, uh, instead of adopting the original wording, which was phase out coal power, it was changed into phase down coal power, and uh, and this was uh, uh, a result of uh, like it was it was uh, insisted upon by the Indian uh, minister, uh, so India gets uh, was. Um, was pointed with a finger at as being the uh, as being the one that have, uh, have pushed for this, but actually it was behind this. There was also the China, and there was also there was also the U.S. behind uh, behind this changing in the wording. And and uh, yeah, well, it was not unexpected that somebody would try to milden the obligations because it's. Uh, it's very complex this uh, this uh, changing and, and reducing an economy that is based on partly on burning fossil fuels to something that is not based on fossil fuels it's not that you can just uh, like in germany you've seen it when the, when the when the decision was made to phase out nuclear power that is not something that happens like at the turn of a key, you just uh, turn off the <laughs> the nuclear power reactors and you just dismantle them and and, 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 and replace course, the power. And of course, there's there's interests left and right. I mean, the, and and a lot of these are economical interests. Um, there's there's a lot of balancing going on, and I'm not saying this to yeah. uh, <laughs> to to agree with what's going on, but it is um, it is interesting that. What, what what has happened and especially what has happened to the wording because that is th- those agreements are in the end binding in some respect they are binding in the sense that there is no well they are binding on the honor and uh, in front of the world population and the future generations because uh, because there is no there are no sanctions uh, for not uh, that's a problem not 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 meeting this but it's also very difficult to in like it's the same it's the same big players that have to say we are going to be doing this and if we don't do it we'll have to pay and uh to whom and to what and um so it's uh, it's it's international politics at a very very high level and uh and i think that uh, the extra day was good to have in order to to like get an agreement going, because the alternative would have been no agreement, and this can happen, uh, like it happened in Copenhagen. Copenhagen, uh, like was, the uh, was a disaster. after Paris was, it was a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> like it was a disaster. Everybody was up and saying like, okay, now we need to do something, and then it, it didn't happen. And so finally, I mean, it's good that uh, agreements can happen, like in, we've seen in Kyoto, we've seen in Paris, especially, and. Uh, and and then I mean I think that I've also uh, will also include a, a link to this uh, other um, this other um, article that appeared in the conversation by uh, Miles Allen, who is professor of geosystem science at uh, at the University of Oxford, so uh, at the Net Zero Center at the University of Oxford, and uh, and uh, he is actually quite uplifting on this because uh, it's not. Uh, like he's saying, well, the the one thing that really happened here is that there was a mention on a mention, a mention of coal. There was a mention of reducing this uh, the impact of coal, and and this is like there is an acknowledgement of a target or where to get there and how to get there, and uh, if it's not phase out, if it's if it's phase down. It's still an agreement, and 
it is it mentioned fossil fuels and and it's the first time that this happens since 1988 it's the first time that a un convention on climate agrees to mention to mention fossil fuels right so it is now it is now up to to see what happens and how this is is kept up there are going to be cops in the future and uh, and and will of course like the monitoring it's not that now we're saying okay now we are on a on a good course uh, now we are we don't uh, we don't monitor <laughs> these things anymore so this is something that uh, will be taken up and we'll see how it develops uh, how, how it develops in the next years but uh, <sighs> there is some hope for the future and it is there is a, quite a good chance that we will stay within the uh, uh, the two degrees uh, Celsius warming limit that was uh, said as uh, not safe, but at least we should keep it under two degrees in Paris in 2015. And uh, and unfortunately, in Glasgow, we didn't come to agree on a 1.5 maximum warming. Uh, that uh, that's one of the uh, one of the big uh, uh, missing parts on the, in the Glasgow agreement but uh, hopefully we'll have more uh, next year with the next COP or in two years time and so, see what happens so, and how these things are, are happening. So we had some big COPs as the Paris one for example the Kyoto one um, Glasgow one feels like it's still a very important one do you expect yeah. the one next year to be as medially present as this one? Uh, I I wonder. I if you if you look at the timeline that we had before, and you look at the different cops, you have you have uh, like cops that are you don't even and I don't even recognize it. Maybe some other people do, but uh, I don't know the Bali cop or uh, yeah, it's, it's like it's uh, the, like there was a, Nairobi, a cop in, in bomb in Nairobi. I mean, yes, they have been they have been something that uh, the people have heard about but uh, the cancun one like that you just passed there or durban or something but but these are the cops where they're not so mediatic but this is where the implementation like smaller agreements that are within like how how to like now the ne the next one is <laughs> the next one is going to be i think i predict that it's going to be about how to do things that were agreed upon in Glasgow. How okay. in practice do we do this? Uh, another thing that was agreed on in, in Glasgow is like to um, to improve the system of mitigation uh, by capacity building. So this one hundred billion dollars a year, it's it's not a large amount of money. I mean, if you think about the U.S. military, the defense budget is seven hundred billions just for the US 700 oh, yeah, billion a year mind boggling so this the, is 100 uh, billion here, for, yes. for for the whole world to just say okay and and now there have to be some more details on how to calculate that something is made for capacity building because uh, there have been things like yeah okay we finance uh, a road in Mozambique and this is capacity building for combating climate change i mean this is not really i mean it's up to the individual countries how to report this but now there have to be more details on how to report on capacity building and how the contribution to capacity building is to be distributed. So I think that the next COPs are going to be working out the details. And then in a few years, hopefully very soon, there's going to be the next update on how to like a next big COP with a with a bigger agreement. And I really do hope that they that that would be about limiting the warming and not just uh, phase down the coal. And in the, the meanwhile, fuels. a lot of groups are keeping the pressure up. So that's... Yes, and, and hopefully also like we are talking about technologies that need to replace coal. And, uh, and the COP fallout is also a push towards like national push. And now we're talking about really big centralized economies like China. They have the eyes of the world pointed at them because it's where we expect that new technologies for batteries, the new technology for limiting climate change is coming out from. I mean, someone, and, uh, someone recently said we have a, a fusion reactor in the sky that shows up reliably every day. So 
Exactly. We, and uh, and, and, and in order to power the entire world, we only need a couple of hundred square kilometers uh, or or a bit more. So it's it's not even yes. that much that much of that energy that we need to harvest. Yeah, it's not that much of the energy out there, but uh, we need to use the energy in a way that is compatible with that source. Sure. Uh, we need uh, to to have uh, storage of uh, sure. of energy somewhere. So we take it from the sun, that's great, but uh, then what about at night or in Tromsø during the during the winter night? <laughs> like how do we how do we do these? Uh, there is the uh, new technologies that are these uh, capture carbon capture and storage, these CCS technologies. Um, they are like a lot of uh, a lot of new technologies. I mean, I think that Elon Musk put out a, a hundred million dollar prize for somebody that can for all the uh, the um, for inventions that can be uh, they can be storing, capture and store carbon uh, in a in a reliable and uh, an effective way. Um, but as you were mentioning, nature has been capturing carbon for a long time, and uh, and <laughs> so trees in, in, they in, are including very good. including in wales as including we said in wales. Here before um, including which... wales the oceans and which actually can bring us to to the finishing touch in this one here what a nice episode, segue shouldn't we <laughs> yes i think uh, that uh, we would like uh, we were talking i i suggested and chris actually agreed on on this that we would finish out by presenting you a little video about a little organism that is actually one of the big carbon capturing organisms <laughs> that are in the ocean. Mm -hmm. And this, this is, is about a, Antarctic a video krill. by the WWF uh, UK. Yes. And it's about krill. And they are, it's about krill, the superheroes of the ocean, and about how many there are and uh, how do they live. It's, it's popular, so it's a popular science, so it's not very complicated. But uh, the one thing that uh, comes out of this is that they are a carbon sink. When they, they eat the phytoplankton, and uh, so they, uh, they capture the carbon that had been captured by the phytoplankton, and then they produce their exoskeleton, and they shed the exoskeleton when they, when they grow. And this exoskeleton, nobody eats it, and it goes down to the bottom of the ocean. And, and so it captures carbon. At the same time, it's also what Chris was talking about before, like uh, the krill is eaten by the whales, the whales actually digest it and they process it and the product, the whale poo, is actually fertilizing the oceans and capturing carbon by having more phytoplankton. So it is very, very important. But of course, there is also the problem that uh, climate change can have an influence on krill and uh, and it's, uh, krill is not a solution to the problem, but uh, it's part of the solution to the problem. I like this. It's a very, very well produced video. Yeah, it's it's really nice, and uh, especially for now, uh, for the people that are working, like our own Hendrik, that is down going towards the Southern Ocean. And this is uh, this is a little uh, a little wink to to him down in the Southern Ocean. Yes, we miss you, Henry. Come back, come back, yes. please. No. Anyway, um, that okay brings us to the end of this no nope, wrong button <laughs> there was totally start again. <laughs> I, i'm i'm so i'm so confused uh it doesn't matter we are at the end of this episode and um thanks everyone for being here uh, hopefully next time with some better news <laughs> it's all it's all crazy um yeah you can find us online at our usual spots the future no cu curiouslypolar.com how about that one until next time take care everyone bye bye take care <laughs>